so if I look at this animal, right, right off the bat, there's a bunch of things going on that's noteworthy. So if I look at his lower jaw, so his lower mandible, I will see that it doesn't seat. The gums are not seating well. So I'm going to show you how to manage metabolic bone disease and first of all some of the complications, how to identify it, and some of the remedies. This is all due to a history of metabolic bone disease, and I'm going to explain actually what it is. But right off the bat, so we call it MBD, and we have this. Uh, sometimes when it's in the state of not being rectified, it will be soft. It makes it actually hard for the animals to actually eat because it doesn't have the sturdiness and the strength of a, a calcified bone structure. Another thing, you have malformities. Uh, you can have a really swollen limbs that make it look really big and muscular. Here we actually have uh, to the point where the animal is now malformed. So that is not like a normal leg. So I don't even know, you know, what actually happened to this guy. And uh, this is, you know, there's a lot of things to correct. This animal is physiologically never going to be uh, the same. It's never going to be a, a, a classic bearded dragon because of what's happened to it in its life, we can fix it and we can get this animal out of the state of duress, but uh, first of all, identifying it. So identifying it, soft mandible, upper or lower. Uh, you could have uh, big swollen legs where it looks really weird. Uh, animal not being able to get up and actually walk because there isn't enough sturdiness in the bones. So the day to day, animals like a bearded dragon, an iguana, tortoise, whatnot, what they're going to use, they're actually going to use the calcium in their system, in their bones, as part of the metabolic process. And what they do is they use the calcium is, uh, is imperative for nerve communication. So they're actually consuming and utilizing the calcium in their system uh, for the nerves to work. And one thing you can often, uh, a real obvious state of MBD is where you get the erroneous twitching. You just have a beard dragon, it's just, it's, it's limbs are, I'm trying to do the, the beard dragon twitch, but it's so ridiculous. I'll see if I can find a clip and include it. Okay, so they're sitting there twitching. What's happening is the nerves are firing. They don't have the needed calcium to quiet everything, so they're firing. And so you have uh, receivers and senders that are not able to communicate properly because they don't have the calcium. Because that animal has basically exhausted the calcium reserves of its bones and the calcium that's uh, active in the, the bloodstream. Super, super important. Uh, we in captivity are trying to replicate a natural state that these animals you know, exist in and that has, they have the, uh, the splendor of having sunlight with full spectrum, we get the, the heat, we get all the different things these animals have evolved to deal with. But the sun, uh, the sun spectrum, the UV, the ultraviolet spectrum, the part that these animals are utilizing actually helps elevate the D3 hormone in their system. And when we elevate the D3, we have uh, almost like in humans, it'd be the, the good feel, like I'm feeling better. So they've learned they take people, put them in work environment, and then give them uh, full spectrum lighting with some UV. That D3 exposure will actually elevate our, our mood, but it actually does more things than that. Certainly reptiles, because they're sun worshipers, it does something that's very, very critical, and I'll explain that. So we need, with a bearded dragon, we need to provide D, uh, or vitamin D3, because we want to elevate this hormone, and when you have D3 present in the bloodstream, that hormone, it's gonna allow the calcium influx in the feeding. So if you give it uh, crickets or roaches or whatever that's laden, you know, veggies or whatever that are laden with calcium, when they ingest the calcium, they're actually gonna be able to utilize the calcium that's now in their diet. And that will help build bones, nerve communication, metabolism, and day-to-day, uh, -day, you know, bone structure. So that's really critical. 
if the D is not managed and we are not artificially feeding them the D3 and we're not simulating ultraviolet with full spectrum to propagate D3 levels, uh, what happens is the animal can ingest calcium if the calcium is even being provided. We're going to get to that. But ingest the calcium. Without the D3, the calcium actually doesn't uh, get synthesized and actually it would go right through the animal. The animal can't utilize it, so it can't use it for its bones. And as these animals are growing, their, their bones need calcium. So even if you're providing it there, but you're not managing your D3, you're going to still have a problem. Okay, so we have calcium with D3. This is Rapashi. All Rapashi is just wonderful. But uh, so what's good about this? This has calcium and probably things like magnesium and D3. So when the animal ingests this, it gets the calcium it needs, but it also makes sure that the D3 levels are elevated so it can synthesize and utilize the calcium and the minerals in the diet. Um, this could be used when I don't have a good UV light source. If I have a really good UV light source, I can use something, calcium without D3, because I'm providing UVB. This is going to imitate the sun, guys. Critical. So things like this. We are all about bringing up your UV B levels. UVA is heat. UVB is the spectrum that's going to imitate the sun and that when this little guy is subjected to that, it's going to bring up the D3 hormones. When the D3 hormones are elevated, the calcium in the diet is rendered and it's utilized as part of their day to day. So this is an excellent bulb. This provides heat and it also puts out a, a pretty strong output of a UVB. Uh, one thing to note, fluorescent bulbs, either a T5, T8, whatnot. Uh, fluorescent bulbs such as this, you want to date them and uh, you'll notice if you hit this with the UV uh, B meter, you'll notice that the uh, production of UVB will start to decline. So I'd probably date them for like eight months, a year, no longer, you know, at, at one year, you know, the output from something like this has gone down a lot. These guys are more high output UVB, they also are a little bit more costly. Another thing. Do not put glass, glass between a source like this and your animal. So if I had a piece of glass here and I'm shining this down on this dragon, what's going to happen is the glass is going to reflect a lot of that UV light 90 degrees to its axis. So there's going to be a lot of polarization essentially. It's actually going to cause a lot of that uh, very desirable UVB that we're trying to get. It's actually going to cause it not to get to your animals, you're kind of defeating the purpose. So glass, if we have like, you know, sunlight coming through a window, largely a lot of that UVB is lost. I mean, the animal can enjoy the heat and stuff. I'm sure there is some UV penetration, but you need to understand these very, very basic things. Glass will filter UVB. Also, the projection, if you go into this one, because this is weaker than the, you know, power sun. So this, the projection, the lumens, which is like the light, the, the, the power of the light, you know, when we see visually, that's one thing. But I want the projection of UVB. And it's not very strong when you're going from a power compact or a fluorescent. So the closer you can have it to your animal, so, you know, let's say within 16 inches, the better. Screen top, UVB can penetrate through that. Uh, but all these different things. So if I had a UV source right here and it was fluorescent, that'd be really great because this animal is going to go over there, it's going to seek it out, and it's going to want to bask. Something like this could be a little bit further away. We're not talking about temperatures because somebody like this might like 120, 130 degree hot spot. But uh, let's get into another big thing, which is about nutrition, which is the origins of, of a lot of our problems with uh, like this bearded dragon and uh, MBD and also just nutritional deficits. So something like beer dragon is an insectivore, but it's also, you know, an omnivore. So it's going to eat uh, vegetation, it's going to eat, you know, greens, uh, it'll eat flowers, it will eat other bearded dragons, it'll eat other lizards, so it gets massive uh, influxes of protein. But when we're feeding things like crickets and roaches and king mealworms, jojobas and all that different stuff, it is imperative. Remember this, guys. You must gut load the cricket. A lot of times people will feed the cricket, 
with an empty gut or has something like potatoes. That's, that's useless. The potatoes is starchy. It's just going to provide moisture. So what we're really interested in is taking the cricket and getting it to eat something which is nutritionally viable like this that has vitamins already mixed in it, which is really good. With a big full belly and a hydrated cricket, now you're feeding that to your little bearded dragon. So this animal is going to benefit from the contents of that feeder insect. So when you guys buy crickets, bring the crickets home. It is critical you gut load your crickets. And when I say gut load, you know, I'm going to throw in a bagel and some cereal. No, 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 no. You need something way better. So if I look at any, like I said, rapashi stuff is excellent. But uh, you can get grub pie, which is excellent. There's a crested diet. There's all different stuff. So you want to just nutritionally complete. Hey, so hey what, if, let's say I'm in a bind. And I, uh, let's say I'm, I don't want to buy this. And I'm going to be cheap no matter what. But I have a bearded dragon. What can I use? Well, you can start using. So if we use uh, leafy greens, which are kale, chicory, chard, dandelion greens. Things that... See, this guy's got problems. <laughs> so don't I. But well, whatever. So, Hello! So what can I use? Like, 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 because there's gonna be people that refuse to buy this stuff. So what, what else? Guys, this is this is it's like your children. Like, okay, I'm gonna take little Johnny and I'm gonna. Hey, Johnny's over there gnawing on some lettuce. Mm -hmm. Well, if Johnny gnawing on lettuce for a couple of weeks, Johnny's gonna have some problems. Okay, <laughs> yeah. uh, bearded dragons are really gonna have problems. But this is this goes right down to you know baby tortoises, adult tortoises, all these different stuff. So we. It's easy for us to buy these animals and it's easy for us to put this in a, a pseudo-correct situation where we have the husbandry. So the husbandry is the, the literal technique and how we're keeping these animals. But now I have to get down to nutrition. And nutrition a lot of people don't understand. So as these guys are growing and they, they rapidly grow, certainly bearded dragons, if we're not meeting their demands of what they need, we're gonna have all sorts of uh, structural problems as this guy grows and then you get you get an animal like this that's just uh, has a lot of problems. Okay, here's I'm going to give you guys a very key point people don't realize. So calcium. Well, we, we build bones with calcium. We have nerves communicate. It's part of metabolism. It's part of the digestive process. Well, actually, how is calcium actually part of the digestive process? Well, one aspect is, so this guy eats, let's say he eats a bunch of crickets. So he's got a big gut full of crickets. Then what he does, the, the body is releasing acids, pretty strong acid, and it's digesting the contents of that cricket. So as it's digesting that, once it's complete digesting the, the cricket, it needs to neutralize the acid. And what the animal does is the bones are your base, your alkalinity resource, which would be a place of calcium. So imagine the bones of having these little micropores, and in these little micropores, it stores things like magnesium, stores things like calcium. So anything, uh, calcium is used to neutralize acids. So the acids in this little guy's stomach, once he's done digesting, the stomach needs to neutralize those acids, because if you don't do that, you can have all sorts of health problems. And this is very, you know, classic with people. We largely like to eat like American uh, diet, which is all sorts of really complicated fats and meats. And as we're digesting that, we dump all this acid into our stomach because we don't want the food to rot. Because if the food were to rot, we have something called uh, pancreatitis. And pancreatitis is, is pretty awful. Well, we need to neutralize the acid. So then we rob our bones of the calcium to neutralize all that. And that's called, the, the process is actually called metabolic acidosis. But it still occurs in predators and whatnot. And in humans, when we're not managing that properly, we get things like acid reflux, heartburn, esophageal erosion, things like that. But with a little guy like this, the calcium is really critical to neutralize that. So I think if I were to feed this guy all these complicated you know, meals like digesting insects, maybe rodents and whatever, and I don't give him calcium, we're going to start sliding this animal to a very acidic state. It's probably uh, its well-being. It's not going to feel good. You're going to have all sorts of uh, consequences right there. I don't think a lot of people actually think like that. And I'm just a dweeb, so I think like this. How do we resolve it? Okay, so we make sure our husbandry is nailed. So we are providing calcium with D3 if we don't have a very good UV light. If we do have a really good UV light, we can provide calcium without D3 and we'll rely on the spectrum of that UVB to elevate the D3 hormone levels 
to allow calcium absorption as well as other minerals that are in the diet. We're of course going to feed uh, dark leafy greens, we'll exclude uh, spinach in this one, but kale, chicory, chard, dandelion greens, certainly things like grated squash, some different fruit, but think about nutritionally dense uh, type greenery and uh, vegetation and whatnot, as well as insects and some uh, animal-based proteins for somebody like this. Okay, so we're now, we got the proper temperatures. I'm not going to go over all the little, you know, ins and outs. Another thing, bearded dragons, very, very critical. Give them shallow water. They, you'll notice that actually they'll go into the water and they might actively, I like how I'm pretending to bathe, but uh, they actively start splashing around in there. They'll defecate in there, but a very shallow dish, which is a larger dish, is more, they're more apt to actually go in there. But when they're doing that, they're drinking. And uh, as these animals age, they lose the, um, their, their kidneys just start declining. So the more water that we include in these guys' diet and certainly through vegetation, uh, long term, it's, it's going to, you know, it's probably going to increase the life and the likelihood of uh, survivorship of something like this because these guys can live like seven years. So uh, now I got my husband you're right and I've just rescued an animal or something like that. How can we do some intensive uh, care? So what we're going to do, we're going to start with things like this. We have, uh, we have liquid calcium supplement, but pretty much you can come up with a lot of, so we're gut loading our insects, and then we're using calcium with D3. And we can then take this and put this into a watery slurry, maybe with some baby food, maybe something that it likes to eat. And we can um, use a little uh, syringe without the needle and you draw up a bunch of you know calcium and D3 and then you try to open this guy's mouth and this guy's mouth is pretty easy for me to open up. I'm pretty good at opening snakes mouths and lizards mouths. You know it's a really tricky one is your mastix. So one thing you're gonna note, you might notice that there's a lot of there could be like with a really bad metabolic bone disease it'd be like a squishy mouth and we need to fix that really quick because these guys are going to fail to thrive. They actually won't even be able to even kill the cricket or the roach or whatever they're trying to eat because their mandibles are not strong enough and they'll, they'll get tired really easily, they'll lose interest, a failure to thrive, a horrible depression in the animal, they're just sitting there miserable. So what we're going to do is we might need to tube this guy some um, like grub, grub pie would be excellent. So a grub pie, something like that, would be uh, excellent to put into like a, a liquid form when you first, you know, make it really like a slurry so that's very watery to get this down here. One thing, make sure we understand something. When I give something like this, a little syringe of food, right, I, if I put it right at the end and the animal's kind of battling me, it, it could breathe it in. So now it can asphyxiate on this liquid that's actually entering the lungs. So I kind of want to get it to the back of the mouth. And the quickest to get it to the back of the mouth and shoot it right down, just like bam. So it's just, it's pretty much done. We know when we're medicating a cat or a dog, you know, quick is what actually works. Same thing with these guys, but, you know, appreciate that they could be, you know, struggling and fighting you and uh, breathing it in. And when they aspirate that, that fluid into the lung, it really kind of causes panic. Uh, it's, it's not a good thing and sometimes you actually make the situation way worse because once you get this foreign material into the lung, lungs, that material is actually a great place for bacteria to grow. So you could uh, cause a whole new problem. So we could cause a respiratory infection or whatever. So right now, it's just to break it all down so we have proper husbandry. Uh, we, we're understanding the benefits of UV light, calcium with D3, D3 generated from UV light, or artificially added in, in the diet, gut loading all insects, also uh, spraying, you know, putting calcium and, and uh, other uh, vitamins on the vegetation that they're bringing in. So a varied diet is really good too. Sometimes you get an animal that's only stuck on eating like one, one thing. Sometimes that's an animal that's not doing so well. So they're kind of like on the edge of failure to thrive. Well, you only eat this. So you probably want to Go back, rethink your husbandry, uh, maybe expand your ideas, uh, maybe improve your husbandry, expand your ideas, what you think is actually correct, and then start offering some of those other food items. Because if I just take an animal like this and I only were to feed it crickets its entire life and I'm not including vegetation and whatever, I'm really not kind of 
feeding what this, this animal has evolved to actually do, where it actually evolved to eat all sorts of ve vegetation and grasses and whatever. He's just struggling away. Uh, so we've got that, and if we actually rescue an animal, now we know that we need to really get the calcium with the D3 into that animal, and we need to possibly uh, baby it with uh, added input of uh, good foods. And a lot of times, uh, baby foods are really good. So you can get plum baby food, apricot baby food. So if I get this in this guy's mouth, it's going to respond because it's got uh, receptors on its tongue for sweetness. And uh, they like color, like reds and oranges and all that stuff like that. They're really going to like. So remember, I'm just talking about a bearded dragon, but this is very applicable to tortoises. This is applicable to iguanas. This is applicable to, you'll see, leopard geckos, which is entirely carnivorous when they eat insects, but they also have a high demand for calcium. And once again, we have a nighttime animal. So if we have a nighttime animal, well, how do I manage the D3 levels if he doesn't really want to bask? It doesn't really want to bask. So what I do is I make sure that I include D3 with the calcium. So nocturnal animals, nocturnal animals need D3 provided in the diet as well as possibly just a little bowl. Like leopard geckos will actually go over there and lick up the calcium just as toke geckos will. And if I have things like uh, lichianus and ciliatus and all sorts of uh, rachidactylus type geckos, uh, it's part of their diet because they're largely nectar feeders. They're also insectivores, but they're going to lap up all of this nectar and bee pollen is excellent and all that stuff. But it's very easy to make a slurry for uh, any of these uh, Caledonian geckos where they're actually going to lap it up in calcium and D3, magnesium, and all the minerals are, are part of that. All right, here's another reality, certainly with bearded dragons, talking a little bit about wounds. This is not like a video where we're going to invest a lot of energy talking about how to actually manage wounds. But bearded dragons, when you breed them and you keep them together, they're not designed to be all together. This is just what nature does. They'll just drive each other off so they have their own spaces. But in captivity, we don't really always do that. So the way we deal with that is actually we try to manage their diet and having good nutritionally dense items and then frequency of feeding. So if I have a bunch of these little bearded dragons, this, this fall and there's a lot of flies and they're driving me crazy. So uh, they will naturally nip each other's tails. Certainly little snapping turtles will do this. So this one actually lost its foot, but they're ridiculous. So remember, a beer dragon is a predator. Its nature is to find all available food resources. And if it happens to be your brother or sister, maybe I'm going to eat that too. And this will go to, you know, chameleons and whatever. So you have a whole psychological problem when there's a whole bunch of them crowding in there. You start getting more like alpha animals, although that's incorrect. It's more like I'm bigger. I'm going to eat you. I'm going to pick on you and I might kill you. So an animal like this, this guy lost his foot. And it, it's, it's horrific, it can happen just like, in the morning it has a foot, in the afternoon it has a crushed up digit. It, it, it's really horrific. So we were kind of looking at this one. Um, it's, it's closed off, they have an incredible ability to heal. So I could take something like a tegu and break part of its tail and the tail can regenerate, but what I don't want to do is if the tail gets hurt and then you notice over time it starts rotting up the tail. So that means you have an active bacterial infection going on. So something little like this, you could actually take nail trimmers and once you clean it off with alcohol, clean this up with some kind of a wound disinfectant like a betadine, proboiodine or whatever. Uh, chlorhexidine. You clean it off really well so you want to get rid of all the ambient bacteria and fungus and all that different stuff. So you clean it up and then you just do a quick little boom and then you for the next week or so you keep treating that. You want to uh, betadine and provoiodine will actually help dry it out and you just you can soak that in there, sit down and watch TV, soak the little guy's tail. I can do the same thing with his foot when I actually have a foot that's hurt and uh, I can just like soak him in that solution and uh, that actually can have a really good result. Um, dried up, dried and crusty is way better than wet and swollen and smelly because wet, swollen, stinky, all that stuff, that means there's an active bacterial infection. So if I dip that animal and I sit there and let it soak for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, that will help 
Um, but sometimes that's the only thing I can do without actually using uh, systemic antibiotics, which comes down to intramuscular injections or oral uh, antibiotics in general. Uh, so a lot of times we only have access to topical or soaking. Soaking is better than just applying something on there with a Q-tip and leaving it. If I can sit down there and soak for 10, 15 minutes, even uh, dilute bleach in water and soaking that part of the foot, that will actually kill a whole bunch of bacteria. But what we're trying to do, we want to dry it out. We want it so it's hard. At that point, that's the body trying to protect it. So it's trying to uh, repair what it can. And as long as it's not stinky and it's hard like that, this is all part of what the body does. Uh, certainly when you have metabolic bone disease, what happens is you'll actually get like elbows where the whole elbow swells up. And what that does is there's fibrous material, fibrous tissue. And what it's trying to do, it's trying to support that limb extremity where the calcium is no longer providing a strong bone. So it creates all this fibrous tissue and that makes their, their legs swell up, makes it look like it's, you know, maybe it's a really strong animal. No, no, no. That's all really negative. And uh, when you even correct that situation by fixing its diet and its uh, mineral content and whatever and its UV light, it's going to take a while for that to manage itself. And it often will never be as accurate as it was. It will never be the, you know, that perfect leg. So uh, that's you know thing you understand. So it creates all this fibrous tissue. And what it does is tries to locate that, prevent it from doing this because it's trying to fix it. And uh, so sometimes we just have to be realistic. We realize that even though we've right, righted the problem by fixing you know, the intake and whatever in the husbandry, we're gonna still have to manage this. So if something like this, this little guy is doing well, he's eating well, uh, I want to keep it clean, I want to make sure I'm nailing the husbandry, and uh, as it goes here, I don't see any way for uh, fluid to come in there and stuff like that, so I'm going to leave this guy for like the next week and kind of watch it. But what I expect, at some point this is all going to go down. Clearly they do not regrow their foot, so you're just going to have a little nub. Okay, got it. And don't forget to like and subscribe and certainly join our Twitch audience. We go over these videos on Friday nights at 8 o'clock, I guess, in yeah. that time frame. <laughs> certainly follow Evil Morph God as well as New England Reptile on Instagram. And you're part of our YouTube community. We really appreciate your feedback. Uh, lots of cool things. I do want to actually get like a series of these things uh, talking about uh, problems. Uh, respiratory infections in reptiles is another really big one that I'm actually going to go over. But metabolic bone disease and animals pooping on me. I gotta turn my camera on, dude. You didn't turn your camera on!